Good morning, everyone. Uh, very happy to be uh, joined by Kevin today. Uh, so I'm Brian Bicifico, also known as Artema on X, um, gallerist, a curator in digital arts. Uh, and I'm very honored to be joined by Kevin Abosch, which is honestly one of my favorite artists of all time. Um, it should require no introduction, but I will do one nonetheless. Uh, I've personally had the chance to discover his work in 2000. 18, I believe, with the I Am A Coin project that is no immortalized on <laughs> this people uh, everyday uh, render. And, but you might have heard of him at several other occasions uh, for perhaps selling uh, the picture of a potato for over a million dollars, for his project, uh, NFT project 11111, his collaboration with I Weiwei. I mean, he had quite an amazing trajectory. Um, Today we're going to talk about a topic that is as complex as it is fascinating and contemporary, uh, post-human modernism, which might not ring a lot of bell for many because it's pretty much a term that Kevin has coined himself. And I guess the question that many people wonder right now is, what the heck is post-human modernism, Kevin? If you can help us on sure. understanding. Um, yeah, I'm not big on all these post this, post that terms, but this really, I thought it was uh, an apt term. Uh, so post-human uh, refers to the idea uh, of going beyond uh, the current human condition, uh, integrating technology, uh, AI, biotechnology, and exploring uh, transhumanism. Uh, modernism, of course, is a movement of the, the late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, that's uh, characterized by a, a break from a traditional style and form. So just kind of hack those two together. Um, and it's, a, it's an idea that uh, I guess some of these, well, all of these images uh, I think would come under this umbrella term. Um, as someone who works a lot with machines, uh, machine learning and AI, uh, I think frequently about the risk of uh, losing myself to technology. Uh, it, but it's not just, you know, all of us uh, uh, are, are faced with potentially losing some aspect of our humanity through over-integration of technology. And, uh, and I think an aesthetic and understanding has sort of been born out of that. Because you've been immersing yourself in technology for quite a while now. You've been pretty much working on photography and neural networks since, what, 1992? Yeah. And 30 years later, you're still doing the same thing in a way with more modern tools. What has changed? Like, did you feel like it's, we are more inclined in losing your immunity your our humanity this day that we are 30 years ago? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Well, the, the camera, I did a lot of photography. That, that's also a form of technology. Uh, but I avoided, uh, for my entire career, I rejected the notion that I was a photographer. I thought I'm a conceptual artist who happens to work with this uh, machine called a camera. Um, and, and now, today, uh, and after the whole crypto zeitgeist and uh, this uh, boom of, uh, let's call it AI art, um, uh, I think many people don't even realize that I was working with tra so-called traditional photography for so long. Um, and, and I get responses sometimes to my work like, uh, you know, what you're doing is undermining the value of real photography. Uh, and, uh, and you're messing with uh, matters of truth. Uh, as we understand it. And I find it really exciting. I think we're undergoing something of a photographic renaissance. And now, for me, even though I still don't identify as a photographer, I am thrilled because I am a lover of photography. And this, I feel, brings us full circle and is just, uh, it's a renaissance. It's the, next, it's the next step of photography. One thing I've always liked, I was always a bit critical of the notion of post-photography because I was feeling that it was a confusion between photography and photorealism. And you did a tweet recently where you're saying that photography is effectively a, a facsimile of reality. And do you feel like it always has been this way and didn't require to be photorealistic for, for that? Or is that new challenge? Well, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the topic du jour is about uh, that truth is under attack, potentially in ways that it uh, has never been under attack before. And so I like, I like to start with the premise that by definition, a photograph is a lie. It is a facsimile of reality. And um, in, an, in, a, in a recent project I did uh, called Civics, which were synthetic photographs of protest and civil disobedience around the world, um, I, I place myself as, as a photojournalist in, in places and at, at, at events that didn't actually transpire. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, people are alarmed uh, by this, uh, even though I tag everything on, uh, as AI on Instagram and such. Um, but 
the photography has been used and weaponized for years. And of course, bias and staging. And, and it occurred to me as, as we look at uh, streams of images coming in uh, of, of refugees in camps and people coming uh, on, on rafts ashore and in, in every form of photojournalism or a protest in the street, it's amazing how savvy we are as subjects when you're protesting ex, uh, you know, politician or policy and you've got your flag in the air and then you see the media pool show up with all of their photographs, I mean, with their cameras, we, you know what to do. You puff your chest up a little bit more, you cry a little louder, your flag goes up a little higher. So we all start acting. And so to some extent, there's something really dishonest the moment the subject is cognizant that there's media in front of them. So don't talk to me about how honest uh, uh, the real photography is. It can be as uh, more dishonest than anything. And uh, co uh, conversely, a synthetic photograph can be imbued, I believe, with more honesty than you can get in another, uh, say, traditional photograph. The treachery of, imagery, of images. Um, is, I feel like in our space, when we think about AI, we have a very like, positive outlook on it because we're in a space of technologists and so that are quite supportive of those two. Where when you look at the more hard art world, we have a more of a critical dystopian approach to it. And when we look at that, your recent work, there is something of a dystopian vibe to it in a way. Dystopian. Well, that, that, that's interesting. I think at first glance, you could it, it would be, I think, very easy to just write this off and say, oh, this is all dystopian imagery. Mm -hmm. But um, I think there's actually something sort of optimistic about uh, uh, our, our license to work on ourselves and, and react before we're completely consumed by technology. I mean, that image back there of someone uh, potentially performing life-saving surgery on themselves, yeah, you know, visually it's a little grotesque, and, and, uh, uh, but there's also something that speaks to uh, you know, taking action. Um, and I think we're at a critical juncture where uh, we have to take action. As a parent uh, with little kids, sometimes we've got to step in and say, you've got to turn off the device uh, because they're, they're not able to self-regulate. And, and I'm not able to self-regulate. I don't know about yourself. I don't think most of us are able to self-regulate. So there needs to be some, uh, some, some way for us to uh, step in before we, uh, we lose something of our, our humanity. And that can take the form of our ability to communicate, uh, uh, it, it, issues around intimacy with other human beings. Um, you know, we're, it, it, times are changing, and uh, it's not to, so. But back to dystopian. I don't think it's necessarily dystopian. Um, and also, some of this imagery, and even down to like body modification and these things, some some of some some of the aesthetic I think associated with transhumanism is is almost becoming uh, so familiar that I, I, I hesitate to even think of it in, in sort of dystopian uh, terms. Yeah, the social norm have certainly shift, but I'm curious is the ambition you have in your work is to have people realize, uh, have the impact and people realize that they might need to be careful about what's going to happen to in the future and sort of have them, is there like a shock value to it in a way? No, I mean, no, I certainly don't, no, I don't, I definitely don't intend to shock, that's not, sort of my palette of tools. Uh, I'm a, I am a one-trick pony, though, and I think uh, I, I sort of, uh, I, I start with the data set, uh, and I, I uh, distill that emotional value into something that sort of transcends uh, intellectual analysis. So I rather that someone doesn't try to intellectually figure out my work, but they feel it, and that, that's sort of a constant. Um, so it's not about shocking. Uh, it's about moving people in unexpected ways uh, to the extent that they don't fully understand why or how they're being moved, which I also don't think is necessarily important. It's just that they are. And hopefully we'll not lose our humanity in technology through your work. Thank you, Kevin. Thank uh, you. It was nice to chat with you, and I'll go back to Crystal for the next speaker. Great. Thanks. Uh,